Continue from where we stopped, blank verse. Blank verse is a poem without rhyming lines. Yes, there are some poems that have no rhymes at all. So they are blank verses. Other literary principles include characterization. Now, when I mean, when I'm talking about other literary principles, I'm talking about um, things that are peculiar to both prose, drama, and poetry. So sometimes I might tell you in drama, in prose, and then in poetry. So let's pay co close attention. Characterization. This refers to the persons a writer or playwright communicates to us. Yes, most times when you pick up a play, a drama to read or a play to read, and then you pick up your novel, you find out that they have characters. They are the people in the story in its simplest form. They are the people in a story or a play. So the people the writer tries to project to us are the characters. Dialogue. This is the medium of expression or communication in a play. It's what the characters say. It is also the verbal element in drama. So when you pick up your literature, um, when you pick up a work or a drama rather, and then you find out, you see things like Bola and then there's a semicolon and then what are you doing? How old are you? So those words are basically the dialogue. He's probably conversing with another person. Flashback. This is when a character recollects an event or incident in a play. The playwright employs the use of flashback as an element to recollect an incident that happened to a character. That's flashback, more or less like reminiscing or recollecting or recollection of events. So that action alone is flashback. Soliloquy. This is when a character engages in a loud self-talk where the readers or audience has access to his mind of uh, has access to the mind of this character. So you find this done on stage most of the time. A character will just walk in and then begin to talk, speak out. No one is on stage. The character is just talking. So most times when characters do that on stage, they are soliloquizing from and then that's a feature of drama called soliloquy. Then an aside, here a character speaks directly to the audience to the exclusion of other characters on stage. This happens in the presence of other characters. So let's assume you have four characters on stage and then an aside, remember the word aside. The character just steps out a bit and then speaks to the audience. He just begins to talk. That's an aside, the other characters are there on stage, but the character just steps out to talk. If it's in the drama text itself, they will put that in um, a bracket and then they'll write aside. So the character just talks or they'll just put, the narrator would explain that. But when that happens on the stage where other characters are probably talking and then the character steps aside or faces a different direction to talk to the audience, it's an aside. But for soliloquy, the character may move forward and begin to talk to himself. And when the character is talking to himself, the character begins to reveal his inner thoughts like that. Most of the time, other characters are not on stage for soliloquy. But for an aside, characters will be on stage and the, car the person that is doing, that will do the aside, will step to the other side or aside as it's called, the, um, aside the stage or aside the character and then begins to talk. Protagonist. This is the hero or heroine of the play. The protagonist plays the most prominent role in a play. The playwright builds the essential conflict of the drama through the protagonist. Most of the time, in the, literary, in the work of literature, when you read a story, the major character is the protagonist, someone we come to love, someone we come to admire. We tend to love that person, we tend to admire that person. That person is the hero. For, him, for the man or the heroine, a female of the play. An antagonist. This is the character that opposes the protagonist. The antagonist can be seen as the rival in the play. So most of the time, the antagonist tries to put stumbling blocks in the way of the protagonist most of the time, just to create some form of conflict in the play. So when there's an issue between the protagonist and an antagonist, 
it's the conflict in the literary work of art art rather there's that conflict between the protagonist and then the antagonist so they keep having issues or problems or conflicts in the play conflicts arise as a result of these two characters uh, as a result of these two characters most of the time the protagonist is someone that we love for example in the play let me die alone by john cabo you have yoko yoko is the protagonist of the play someone we admire because she's ambitious she's driven and then she has a lot she goes about conquering her territories and then you have the antagonist so the, the antagonists are people in our community or the, 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 the other men in the community who want, who feels that a woman shouldn't go ahead conquering territories, a woman shouldn't rule. So these are people that come to antagonize Yoko in the play. Yoko is the protagonist, but the ideas, the community and the men in the village are seen as our antagonist. Don't know more. This is the resolution of the conflict in the play. It's also known as the unknotting of events in the play. So let's take it this way. You have a play, you have a protagonist, and then an antagonist. Two people um, um, struggling, or they are rivals in the play. So they meet at a certain point. They go through conflicts in the play, and then they meet at a certain pro point, which is the climax. The climax of the play is usually the peak where the protagonist and the antagonist meet. Most times, it's the peak of all the events at that point in time. Then Donomo, after the climax comes the Donomo resolution. Okay, maybe the antagonist dies or the protagonist dies at the end of the play. So if the protagonist dies in that case, it's usually tragic. Then if the antagonist dies, of course, good has conquered evil. So everything ends happily. So Donoma is that stage in drama that tells us whether or not the play will end happily or the play will end sadly, whether it's going to be a tragedy or a comedy. And if it begins on a serious note as a tragedy and then it gets to the Donoma, sometimes it might end happily, which is the comedy. The tragic flaw. This is the flaw of a tragic hero. It's also known as Hamatia. So most of the time, you find out that when you're reading tragic um, plays, for example, you notice that the protagonist being someone that we've come to love and admire, who is driven by ambition, has a weakness called a tragic flaw. So sometimes, because the protagonist is driven by ambition, the tragic flaw might be his or her willingness not to accept for his or her faults. Or it could be women, or it could be a curse that has been placed on him or her. For example, Ola Roti means the gods are not to be blamed. You find out that the tragic hero of that play acted based on the curse that was placed on him at that time, that he would kill his father and marry his mother. In the case of Let Me Die Alone by John Cabo, you find out that Yoko's tragic flaw at that point in time was the fact that she didn't want to be put down as a woman. She was driven by ambition and you couldn't correct her. So she was just power driven and power and wanted power by all means. So she was willing to do everything and anything. And she was the type of character that could not accept defeat in the play Let Me Not Die Alone by John Cabo. She didn't want to accept any form of defeat. So you find out that at the end of the day, when the chi um, when the colonial master, the governor, collected her territories from her. What did she do? She went ahead and committed suicide because she couldn't stand the fact that she had been defeated. In the play Fences, you find out that Troy, the major character, the protagonist, being the type of man who was working so hard for his family, he, didn't, he was that type of person that didn't want to be corrected. Even when he cheated on his wife, he didn't see it as anything. So he didn't want to be corrected in any way. So his tragic flaw at that point in time was the fact that he didn't want to be corrected. He didn't want to accept cor correction. Even when his friend Jim Bono was trying to talk to him, and when Corey, his son, tried to talk to him, he felt he was not at fault in any way. So such characters in the play, you find out that they have a weakness. They are driven by ambition. But at the same time, that is what leads 
that ambition coupled with their weakness is what leads to their downfall. A tragic hero. This is a major character that is loved by readers or audience. Yes, like I said earlier, it's the, it, the, that tragic hero is the protagonist of the play. So sometimes Jam may ask you, he has a flaw that leads to his downfall. It's that simple. A tragic hero has a major problem and is driven by ambition. So based on that, that is what leads to his downfall. The plot. The sequence of events in the story. When you talk about plots in literature, you're talking about the sequence, of, the sequence of events in the story. Sometimes a plot could be chronological. It could go with a particular sequence where you could easily get the beginning, the middle, and then the end of the story. It goes like that. A linear plot is usually straight. It follows a linear order, while an episodic plot does not follow a sequential order. So in other words, an episodic plot might begin with the end, and then back to the beginning, and then the middle. You can't even trace it. Sometimes an episodic, an episodic plot might begin with a crime scene. So if I know that you're reading a book, and then the first thing that comes in, 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 in the story is a crime scene, and then events. It takes you back to events that have happened in the past. So sometimes when it begins like that with the crime scene, we say in literature is media rest. That is, it started from the middle of the story. But that plot in that case is an episodic plot. It's that scene, that episode that showed that it's an episodic plot. It's not chronological. It doesn't go from the beginning to the middle and then to the end. Now we have the round character. When I talk about round characters in stories or in plays, this is a character that is unpredictable. Such a character shows willingness to grow and learn. Round characters change from evil to good. Yes, round characters most of the time in stories are characters that are willing to learn. You can't predict them. So sometimes they may begin as bad people and then end up, an event may happen in the story or in the play that will make that character become good. So that's a round character. They are always, round characters are willing to explore. They are willing to learn. A flat character is a type of character that is unreceptive to change. Most of the time in literature, most of the tragic heroes are flat characters because you can predict them. I gave an, an example, Troy in Fences. You can predict him and predict his decision. Yoko in the play, Let Me Die Alone. You could predict her and you could predict decisions that she took in the play. So these are characters that you can easily predict. Do you know them that this is how they will behave when um, events or incidents come up in the work? This character is usually predictable as readers could easily predict his or her actions. A very typical example, Okonkwo in the novel Things Fall Apart. You could tell that he wasn't willing to change in any way. So when the whites came and they did all they could, he didn't want to accept that and he didn't want to realize that the culture was moving. Eponymous character. This is a character... This is a major character whose name is also the title of the book. I'm sure you must have come across books like Tess of Doublevilles, Mo, Flan Mo Flanders, and Oliver Twist. Most of the time when you pick up books to read, you find out that the names are usually, the title of the books are usually the names of the character. Example, Oliver Twist. Let's move on to narrative techniques. You have the first person narrative technique. This is a narrative technique where a story is narrated through one of the characters. The dominant pronoun in such story is I. So when you pick up a book and then you're reading the book and you see things like, I woke up one morning, I opened my window, I had to get dressed for school and on my way to school I met, that is the first person narrative technique. You easily identify with that character in the story because the writer has made use of the pronoun I most of the time. And sometimes we are tempted to believe that it's probably the writer's story, but it's not always like that. It's just the narrative technique. Third person, objective point of view. Here, yeah, the narrator or author's personal comment about events, situations, and personality are, personalities are deliberately excluded. 
The narrator does not present information or material sourced from the thought or mind of the character. The reader forms his or her opinion about a character about such character. So most times you pick up the book and you read. The dominant um, pronoun here is the third person pronoun, she, they, and he. So when you pick up such books to read, you find out that you just form your opinion. And then when you're reading such stories, you could say, think that this person was bad. And then another person will read that same story and feel this person was good. So you are entitled to your own opinion. It's not direct. Then omniscient narrative technique. Yes, we say God is omniscient. That is God is all-knowing. So when you pick up a ty um, this type of book, it's, the writer delves into the mind of the character. The writer writes as though he is God controlling the characters who are more like puppets. So he writes, he, the writer would write in such a way that you could easily get to the minds of the characters in the story. Here, the writer is able to delve into the minds of the characters. This is like the eye of God method, as the narrator is all-knowing, while the characters are like pawns or puppets. Setting. This refers to the time and place events in the literary work takes place. So sometimes you pick up a book, and then you'd read the story and realize that places mentioned in the book are places in Abuja, or places in Lagos, or places in London. That has to do with setting of the work. Sometimes you could pick up a story and then it would, it would be morning, events that happened that morning, noon, events that happened that afternoon, and then evening, events that happened in the evening. A typical example of a work of art that goes morning, noon, and evening is The Lion and the Jewel. You find out that the setting at that particular time takes is divided into those three sections. So events are tied around that. Theme, the central idea of a literary work. It is sometimes referred to as an issue of life, which a writer discusses in a literary work. So when you pick up your play or your prose text to read, and then you read the story, and you identify wicked acts, or you identify some form of betrayal in the work, or you identify things like discipline, or you identify things like theft in the literary work. These are what? Themes, the central ideas. They come in different aspects. Sometimes you could see thing, theme of, themes of colonialism, themes of education, themes of maybe betrayal when you're reading with incidents to show or to depict that these are the themes. Satire. This is a play, story, or poem that pokes fun at certain issues in the society. When I talk about satire, it's any literary work. So you pick up a play, for example, or a poem, for example, or a, a prose text, and while reading, you find out that the character is just making fun of certain things in the society. That's a satire. A typical example is the Gerald plays by Wale Shoinka. There, Wale Shoinka puts, creates a character called Brother Gerald, who, who is a dubious religious prophet. And then he goes about duping people in the play. So that play on its own is an example of a satire. Allusion. This is an element used by a writer to make reference to an incident in history it could be history, it could be the Bible, it could be in politics. So the writer makes reference. And when you pick up that work to read, you remember, oh, this is probably as, an, as a result of an event that has happened in the past. For example, when you pick up the book, when you pick up the book of Unexpected Joy at Dawn, you find out that the writer in that, of that um, um, prose text Unexpected joy had done alludes to two events in the two West African countries, Ghana during the reign of Kwame Nkrumah, when Nigerians were sent away from Ghana, and then the Ghana must go incident during General Muhammad Buhari's time. So the writer put these events and put them together, and then wrote the story 
um, unexpected joy are done where we have characters from Ghana and characters from Nigeria and the effect of these singular these um, actions rather imagery imagery refers to impressions created in the imagination of the reader or audience most of the time when you read a poem and when you read or a play or a prose text you are expected to imagine so when you sit back and you imagine it appeals to your senses your sense of sight and sometimes you could imagine things that you probably heard maybe when you're reading and then it said the character uh, maybe hit something you could imagine the sound or you could imagine the kind of noise it's made so that have, um, that appeals to your sense of hearing and then most of the times it appeals to your sense of sight you could quickly imagine that so imagery has imagery has to do with the impressions created by the imagination of the reader or audience mood this is how a poem makes a reader feel sometimes you pick up a poem to read and then you are angry yes that's the mood of anger sometimes you pick up a poem to read and then you are happy sometimes you are excited sometimes you are hopeful that's what mood does tone this is the underlining attitude in the voice of the persona towards the subject matter of the poem most times it's usually the inspirational force what inspired that write, uh, that poet to write that poem at that particular time what is the underlining attitude maybe the poet sat down and then was angry and wrote the poem when you're reading the poem out when you're reading the poem out loud you also might get into the tone of that um, persona and you might begin to feel that way persona this is the voice or the person behind the tone of the poem sometimes people say the persona is probably the writer but the poet not always sometimes the persona might be the voice that is the voice behind that poem it's not always where you have the poet as the persona even though it's used interchangeably stanza it is the poetic equivalent of a paragraph in prose when you pick up your prose text you have the stories written in paragraphs but for poem we for poems we cannot have them written the way a prose text is written we can't have them written in the same way as a prose text so most of the time the poems are usually broken into stanzas stanzas of on of unequal length where stanza one could be five stanza two could be seven stanza three could be six or stanzas of equal length where stanza one could be two lines stanza two could be two lines and stanza three could be two lines so most times you could have your stanzas arranged that way verse a poem not broken into stanzas sometimes it just comes straight for example africa by david diop is not broken into stanzas couplets two successful rhyming lines in the poem most times niyoshudare is beginning to do this so for example you have nepa by niyoshudare and then you have the leader and the lead by niyoshudare you have the poems written in couplets of two two lines each of about 12 stanzas triplet or tesset a group of three success successive lines in poetry rhyme refers to sameness of sounds between words in poetry yes when you pick up a poem to read you find out that the end rhymes for example your nursery rhymes that's where that think of your nursery rhyme and then you remember rhymes for example your nursery rhymes at the end of each line at the end of most of the lines in the nursery rhymes you have the rhyme scheme itself the twinkle twinkle little star how i wonder what you are up above the world so high like a diamond in the sky so you have ah and then hi so these are end rhymes most of the time simile let's move on to figures of speech simile the use of like or as to make comparisons now let me make this clear most of the time in your sin or unseen work um, questions they would ask you what's the dominant figure of speech so it's very important we go through the figures of speech so that we have an idea of what they mean and how to identify them so simile is the use of like or as to make comparisons when you pick up when you're tested and an excerpt is given to you and you are asked 
what is the dominant figure of speech. You could easily tell it's a simile with the use of like or as there. A typical example, she's as bold as a lion. She, the human being, is being compared to what? A lion. So most of the time you have a human being being compared to an animal or an object. Most cases. Take note. Metaphor. This is a direct comparison between two elements without the use of like and us. So if I say she's a lion, there's no comparison. I'm saying she's a lion because she's bold. She has certain qualities of the lion. Personification. This is giving human attributes to objects with inanimate attributes. Comparing, most times you give the human attributes to things like um, things like objects or things like maybe the sun, the moon, and the stars. So an example is flood came knocking at their door. So if I want to say their house was flooded, rather than say that I might say flood came knocking at their door and my message has been passed because someone will wonder how can flood knock at the door of the person. But in this case, I have passed the message across. Irony. This is saying the opposite of what a speaker intends. So you look, you, um, a mother walks into the room and sees that her daughter's room is dirty. And then she goes, your room is really tidy. She has passed the message across. And then the daughter understands that the mother is just being ironical. So that's saying the exact opposite of what the speaker means. Hyperbole. This means exaggeration. Example, someone does something for you and then you go, thanks a million. You know, you can't, you can't keep counting the million thanks or thanks a bunch. So that's an hyperbole. Euphemism. This is putting an impolite or offensive remark in a polite way. So when I say she wore a pre-loved dress to the party, I'm not saying, rather than go out saying, oh, she wore a second-hand clothes, or in Nigeria, we'll say okrika. So rather than saying that to the person, which might sound offensive, I could go, she wore a pre-loved dress to the party, and then everyone understands that it's a second-hand clothing. Oxymoron. This is a contradiction because two opposite words have been placed side by side. So we could say the pattern between the couple was a bittersweet one, bitter sweet the god's offspring was born dead born and then dead sarcasm this is a remark that expresses the opposite of what has been stated it is deliberately meant to hurt or criticize the person and irony is not meant to hurt or criticize the person it's just to pass the message across but sarcastic comments are usually deliberately passed to hurt or criticize a person. Example, when a teacher looks at the scanty essay of a student and says, you have obviously given a lot of time to this. The child gets the message and then the child knows that he or she hasn't done anything and might feel hurt by that statement. Antithesis. This refers to the juxtaposition of two opposite expressions. It is longer than an oxymoron. So oxymoron where you have the two opposite words placed side by side, and an antithesis might be longer most of the time. So you have man proposes, God disposes. Many are called, few are chosen. Assonance. This is the use of vowel sounds in a sequence. Example, only Joe rode the boat. The sound O in only Joe, O sound, road, O sound, the boat, O. That's the sound, O sound. That's the O sound there. Kate pasted the date on the gate. So we have A sound. So let's take a break. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> 